I met Yoris in his capacity as lead trainer at Creative Consciousness, but it was a few weeks after I first met you that I watched a short video about who you are and why you do what you do. In that video, you mentioned how you used to think you had to be like Richard Branson. Yes. And then you realised that actually it was more important to be you. Do you remember that moment where you realised you didn't have to be like Richard Branson? Yeah, I think it was like a process. Um, that through creative consciousness and through the uh, awakening trainings, I became very uh, clear about yeah how I was functioning, how my mind was projecting particular futures that, that I thought I would need to create. And actually that I was like, I'm, I'm having Richard Branson as an example and building companies and having like PAs and all kind of financial difficult st structures and um, yeah and, and then the questions came like but is this really what I want um, I once started it with the idea to create financial abundance of financial freedom or uh, from age 45 not to work anymore or to uh, have uh, the final secu uh, financial security um, but then actually it, it didn't provide me freedom at all. It uh, only made me work 80 hours a week and uh, uh, s having one relationship after the other, not being there for my kids, uh, drinking too much, eating too much, late, because always at work. Um, and I loved work, so that was not the problem. And I was making good money and big car and boat and everything. But I was asking my questions, is this really what I want? And um, yeah, then I came to the insight that I actually never chose to be uh, a second Richard Branson or a step in that direction. It was just like because of my, my parents, that they were like entrepreneurs in a particular way, having uh, quite some financial freedom from a particular age, that I was having that as an, as an example, like, oh, I, I should do the same, but then have that financial freedom 10 years earlier than they have. Um, yeah, in, in that conditioning, I, um, I developed my business. So what you said in that video made me reflect on a conversation that I had a couple of years ago. Um, and it was about two years after I'd left my last job. Yeah. And I was experiencing all of this sort of freedom and, you know, there was a lack of structure. There was, you know, really sort of space to, to be whoever I wanted to be and do whatever I wanted to do. And that made me feel at times like I was doing something wrong. Yeah. And I felt like I was breaking the law in some way and um, was chatting with a friend about it and realised, OK, you know, am I actually breaking the law here? Why do I feel like I'm doing something so bad? And I was like, OK, look, I'm not actually breaking the law. You know, my company is registered. My accounts are filed. You know, everything's, you know, my bills are being paid. Like, everything is in order and I'm not, I'm not actually breaking the law. Yeah. But what I did realise is that it felt like I was breaking my own cultural law yes. in the sense that... I was brought up with a model that, you know, when you grow up, you get a job and you, you go to an office and you work really hard and you get paid really well, but you work really, really hard for that money. And at the weekend, you play a round of golf or you do the gardening or whatever, and then you spend the rest of the weekend preparing for the week ahead because you put so much into your job. And then here was I not going into an office, not breaking my back working so hard and it and it just really felt like I was breaking a cultural law I totally get that point where um, where, where you go into a different kind of living uh, like stepping into like a, a new reality where all the things that were true in the past reality suddenly are not true anymore um, so there, there is no security or no, no guidelines or that now how now how does it work here and the only thing you have is like how it used to be that's how we thought oh that, that's how I'm going to be successful that's how I'm going to be happy that's how, how I'm going to have a f fulfilling life um, and that new area is like a whole new exploration 
What was life like for you before? Can you give us a bit of a, a sort of summary of your career to date and sort of how you got to where you are today? Yeah, so I created six different businesses. Um, the first one, uh, I'm originally like a physiotherapist. Uh, the first one was a company uh, which provided uh, health and physiotherapy psychologists and doctors for companies to get people back to work. Uh, from there, I, I saw the connection to uh, the physical health and the body and the fitness industry. So I bought a fitness and health center and combined those two companies. From there, I, I did so much in marketing and sales that I created a small marketing company to, and not having to buy it or uh, somewhere else to have it uh, for my own. And um, from there, I um, created uh, a company with psychologists, fear and depression uh, as a specialty uh, in the regular healthcare in Holland here. And on that journey, I was looking at the behavior of people and wondering how it comes that so many people want particular behavior, uh, like in the fitness industry, like a thousand or 1200 people, new members every year, only 10 or 15% lasted for a year. Most of them stopped or quit doing the new behavior within three months. And I knew that physically we had all the programs and with my background, from a psychological perspective, I thought here is a lot to learn. And there, when I, how I came to get to creative consciousness, to see how do people tick. And that became then the sixth company. So six businesses. Yes. And you see yourself as a bit of a Richard Branson of the Netherlands. Did. Did. did used to. What was that moment like when you realised that actually maybe you didn't want to be like Richard Branson and it was more important to be like you? It was uh, on one of our retreats, actually, uh, that I was in that process already. And then uh, I did a ritual which had to do with death. Uh, and see, um, yeah. Well, if you would die right now, um, how would if your how would your life have been? Uh, would you be happy, uh, uh, or would you wish that something would change? And uh, the insight I got there that uh, all the the corporate th stuff that I was creating didn't matter at all to me, at all. And the only thing that did matter was somebody saying the sentence, ah, oh, it's too bad that uh, he didn't uh, give any grandchildren to his parents. And I was like, oh my God, I want children. I don't want companies, I want children. And I think nine months and a couple of weeks later, my first <laughs> son was born. <laughs> and so what was that like to be in that moment of realizing that you'd been living your life in a way that didn't feel true to what you really wanted? I was still proud of my achievements um, and of the value that I created for the society which was fully in line with who I am and what I want. Uh, um, and I saw that it's, that it's not the best way or the right way or the complete way. So from there, it, yeah, I just went into a, like a space of reduction, just feeling into, does this give me energy? Uh, is it in line still with, uh, with what I really want? But that was complicated because I projected like a whole future of my pension, my future financial freedom. All that was like uh, fully entangled with building those uh, structures. I needed to break that down too and to, uh, to trust that there would be another way that I would be taken care of growing up or getting older. Was that a challenging time for you? That process of reduction? Yes. And, and sort of going from this plan of the, you know, the pension and the properties and the businesses and the cars and the boats to listening to your heart more? And, and going where the energy was. Were, were there challenges in making that transition? Definitely, yeah. Many. Because the moment I found out that it was not what would make me happy, 
I actually didn't really have a lot of energy anymore to put in those structures. Um, but in one of the companies I had like 53 people working, like which was a core team, uh, which I was very close to. Making a decision to sell a company like that with people that are so close, working for 10 years for you, being like real friends and saying, uh, I'm sorry, um, we need to sell the business or I'm selling the business. That is, uh, wow, that was very, very challenging. It got me like into a state of burnout or almost burnout to face all those uh, challenges, actually. Uh, and how did you do that? Because you're clearly in a very different place now yeah. with life. Yeah. So how did you, you know, looking back at it, how did you work through those challenges? Yeah, I think there is like uh, one decision after the other. Um, and I worked a lot with the question, does my energy want to be there? and Does it have really added value for where it is? So I had like one company with the psychologists uh, with the fear and depression. Um, it was maybe financially my best investment uh, and it would have been my best investment ever to stay in there. Uh, but I didn't feel that my energy in there once a month in the board meeting uh, had any real added value of the direction where I was moving with my life. So I just said to the, to the other people, uh, uh, owners, like, uh, hey, I'm, if you feel like I'm open to uh, sell my shares. And that was really not coming from a intellect or from a ego or from earning money, but just feeling that uh, my energy was actually complete there. I, I created it together with them and it was complete and it could move now to something else. And that's one of the biggest insights I had actually recently uh, that that my energy when it's stuck in several things there is not much space for real new creation for real great ideas for and, and the moment I make a decision uh, to withdraw that energy from it it frees up so much space and it and it sparkles so much creativity again for something else or something new or something that isn't more in line with uh, where I'm moving to or my vision. At the same time, um, I think it's like a personal exploration for everyone to, to like with ups and downs to uh, yeah, when you need to say goodbye to a company and then uh, first I had, I had like a break for a couple of months, did nothing. Well, that didn't make me happy at all. Uh, but you need to, uh, it, it was my dream to be on an island somewhere in, under the sun for a couple of months needing to do nothing uh, it was like the ideal life and then it was like the, not the most horrible life but it, it was not bringing that at all so from there I learned hey but I, I need particular structures and I need particular visions and I need uh, putting my passion into expression personal exploration I think for everyone and where has that come from within you? Is there a practice that you follow to enable you to listen to what is working for you and what isn't working for you? So, for example, you know, realising that your energy gets stuck in places and that you're needing to withdraw that energy to be able to move on and find something else. Is that, is that a practice that you've learned? Was that something that's innate within you? Yeah. So what I what I found out is that especially in the beginning I was still very like ego driven. Like my, my and I don't uh, I, I like ego. I, I love ego. It's part of me and uh, it has a lot of qualities and it's great. So I created a lot of structures out of ego uh, strategies. And even when I was conscious that it was not my direction, I found out that all the new commitments that I took were still like ego driven, still looking for financial abundance. Uh, um, and in that process, uh, also by doing other personal development steps and bodywork steps, uh, like the uh, Master of Intimacy retreat was a big breakthrough for me. Uh, there I increased my receptivity 
and with uh, yeah I think if you asked me five years ago how is my your receptivity and can it do you have potential to grow there I would have said oh my my receptivity is great and I'm I have no clue what you would talk about uh, increasing the receptivity but after having increased it I was like oh shit I was only uh, maybe at 30 percent of my capacity and with opening up and increasing receptivity feeling in my body in my mental body in my emotional body in my physical body what brings me energy what works where does it want to say yes to and where does it contracts and uh, actually gets ill or or stressed um, that by learning that um, I more and more uh, are able to choose commitments that are really in line with all of those bodies and not only with my mental body or with my uh, ego and vision perspective. Mm. Have there been, apart from this Richard Branson moment, have there been any other times and any other sort of cultural laws that you've become aware of that you've you've realised, oh, hang on a minute, you know, I'm, I'm following this cultural law, this belief of how things should be, and actually it's not in line with my energy, my body, you know, what, what I'm, what, you know, where my energy is wanting to go. Has there, has there been anything else? How many do you want to hear? <laughs> <laughs> pick, pick me one. <laughs> no, there are so many. Because uh, um, I was conditioned to think very much in line with how the whole society is built. Uh, like the school structures, the structures that elderly people need to go to elderly home where there are other people taking care of them, not their families. Um, systems where we all live in a separate house uh, sitting in a little backyard garden uh, with ten, 10 families in a row all 10 having a separate barbecue with the kids wanting to play together but can't because they need to be in the family barbecue with me and uh, all that there are so many structures actually that uh, or the, the, the cultural laws that, that I became aware of uh, yeah, that I, I felt like I need to redesign the whole society, which is now one of my quests that <laughs> to yeah, find a new one. So you feel like there's more cultural laws that you're living by at the moment that you want to break yes, free still, from? Yes. What are you doing about that? Well, I'm creating like a, a space where a community can uh, connect to each other. Um, we're doing that online at the moment but, and we are looking for a location where we can also offline connect to people more and come together and live together and do projects together that's one of the well it's it's like a huge thing because it can involve like a different way of healthcare different way of uh, food what we create different way of schooling different way of elderly care different way of youth care uh, so it, that project involves actually most of all the uh, strugglings that I uh, see in society. Next to that one, I think the, my cultural laws, laws regarding to relationships, I wouldn't say that, it, uh, that I'm changed, but I'm, I'm much more open now to explore what is available in the area of relating to people instead of uh, searching it in my old conditioned way of prince and princess and finding each other and living happily forever which still is inside of me as a, a dream or a, something I'm looking for in the, on the background but I'm not letting that stand in the way of now relating to people more and uh, exploring that area if there's someone listening who has identified a cultural law that they're living their life by and they want to do something to, to make a change and they might be finding it scary or challenging to, to break. Because, you know, the reason I'm calling it cultural law is because it feels like a law, right? It feels like you're breaking the law when you step outside of this belief for the first time. What would you say, what one piece of advice or gift of wisdom would you say to someone who is breaking free from one of their own cultural laws? Yeah, 
Yeah, I, I think I have a very good advice and a very difficult one because it's so opposite to what we are conditioned or in our cultural law to go to do. Uh, so for me, the the fire the underneath my butt to change anything is to be present to the pain of the current structure. And that is actually what we are avoiding in our society uh, to, to, to feel, to feel the pain of the separate old people and the people living separated and the children in school systems. And, and we, we are aware of it, but we don't really feel the pain. And if you move into allowing yourself to open up, to just be for five minutes or ten minutes to just become present to the pain of those people and the systems and that we are actually by not doing anything else we're actually reinforcing them we are part of it everybody who's everybody who's not doing something else is being part of keep maintaining it so we i'm part of creating that pain in society i think when i when you become present really present to that pain for yourself the costs of other people yourself uh, that's like that's like a sparkle of energy that moves you in a different direction and I don't think you need to think with your mind how to change it or what to do or I think if you really feel that pain that already is enough uh, then the universe or whatever life will tell you and will give you the directions to uh, start changing uh, that area or that thing in your life. How does life compare for you now compared to your you know, your Richard Branson days and life now, what's changed? Well, <laughs> uh, I could say almost everything. How does it feel, life now compared to life then? Well, it's still life. Uh, it's still ups and downs. It's not like uh, suddenly the magic happened and I'm only ex uh, experiencing bliss and happiness. And I'm also not looking actually for, to only experience bliss and happiness uh, anymore. But life changed a lot. Like I went from uh, 7.5 average, which sometimes went to 6.9 and many times went to 8.2. I went to now 9.8 and lowest is like 4.2. So it, there came like a... It's like if I was cooking only with pepper and salt in the past and now I have a whole spectrum of tastes and qualities that, I, that I've added to my life. And it's still life. So it's going with ups and downs and breakthroughs and breakdowns. And now I can cry. I couldn't really in the past. Now, the more I can cry, the harder I also can laugh now. So given that you're... Highs are higher and your lows are lower. Would you trade anything back? No, never. No, no. Uh, maybe what I shared is more the outside and the physical experience. But looking from uh, the idea of a soul, I think my soul was quite unhappy. Deep, deep, deep from within. I wasn't really aware of that actually because I... I would really say I was very happy already, uh, but comparing to now, now my soul is more smiling and uh, more playing like a child, have experiencing the freedom of a child, uh, but in, in the big playground of the world. And uh, back then my soul was more like uh, serious and uh, yeah, uh, aligning with what was expected in society to be successful. Do you feel like you're living life closer to your truest self? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm, I'm more and more exploring actually what my true self is. Because um, yeah, nobody told me what my true self was. And I'm still finding out every day actually. Given everything that you've learned along the way, everything that you've experienced in your life, all of those moments that you were living inside the box of your cultural laws, and then all of the ways that you've sort of broken free from that. What would you say to your younger self now? Keep playing. 
Is that enough? <laughs> <laughs> that can be enough if that's all it is. Yeah, so yeah, don't become too serious because uh, all those serious things, yeah, they they have value, but they're not the most important. Uh, so I have that as a third or a fifth priority to also be serious and think uh, serious. But number one and number two, keep playing, yeah, because life is a play. Are you living life now how your younger self might have designed it? Yeah, I think I'm, I'm getting closer and closer. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And what do you think your younger self would say to you now? I think he uh, says uh, that he's uh, proud and uh, that he likes to be with me. And uh, yeah, that he's, he still has a lot of visions and wants to create a lot and everything... Um, well, yeah, one step at a time. Is there anything with regards to cultural laws and how you're living your life now? Is there anything that I should have asked you that I didn't ask you? The thing with uh, the cultural laws, I think, is we are so unaware that we are living inside of them and seeing that as our reality. So it's good to become aware about, hey, this is a cultural law, and this is a law that I actually don't agree, and um, I don't know a question, but um, yeah, what comes up for me is that that always having that question mark, is this really true? Is this really how I want to live? Um, and even the reality as I see it, to have an opening that is actually only my interpretation which is in line with that that cultural law uh, which is conditioned um, yeah but to li to live as the as that opening actually that, that there is more uh, as a potential than all the cultural laws that we are living what's the most powerful question that you ask yourself you you mentioned like is this true that that's <clears throat> that's one of the questions that i'm examining all the time is this really true and then I start exploring the topics in my trainings. Every time, I, every, when I have done a training maybe 20 times, the 20th time I'm still looking at every subject in there. Is this really true? And then how, if, if it's not fully true as it's written, then how would it be true for me right now, where I am right now? And to redesign it again. That's one of the, yeah, that, I think that's one of the biggest questions that I'm living.